crash. And uh, what happens is that it stores the information about this crash in some hardware. And after we reboot, uh, this will be queried by one of the uh, one of the launch demons, and will read that and will dump it into a file on your file system on your on your iPhone. Um, you can actually access that on a non-jailbroken device. First of all, by going to the right menu, so you can just see it on your device itself. There's a menu for that. Um, the other thing is you can, when you connect your device to, for example, Xcode uh, on your Mac, then it will sync uh, and uh, download all this information, and then you can see it in your Xcode. And if you did not switch off all the don't send to Apple buttons, the next thing happens is that Apple fixed that vulnerability. Uh, so I'll never forget when you work on iOS kernel kind of stuff to disable this sending to Apple. Or just make your make your whole network not being able to connect to Apple. Okay, so um, there's another way to get this information. You can basically do the same way as Xcode by connecting your device to USB and then use something like libmobile device or the mobile device framework and just uh, talk to the lockdown demon directly with your own code and just pull out the panic downs and all the crash downs and then you can make use of it. So what is such a, a panic dump? This is basically a text file and it looks a lot like this. Um, I used one of the new ones, so uh, when you see here, this is from an iPhone 5S. Uh, um, well, actually, I have, a, I have a Zoom version from, of that. So you see the registers here, uh, there are quite a lot of them, so this is not a normal ARM 32-bit device, this is a new iPhone uh, 5S on an um, iOS 701. And uh, this is obviously a, a kernel bug in iOS 7 that I triggered and then this uh, uh, dump was get generated and in order to not uh, give you the vulnerability, I uh, basically X'd out all the endings so uh, uh, you will not be able to find the actual code unless I forgot one important thing. In the beginning when I did all this I was like, oh no, I'm finished and then I realized I, I didn't cross out the program counter, which was the most important one. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so now there should be no way to reveal uh, what's going on. I even changed these small values to something completely random so that they wouldn't give anything away either. Because you know, uh, something like this happened a while ago. Uh, some of the jailbreakers was uh, recording a video of his new, uh, new uh, kernel exploit that he wanted to keep secret posted the link to Twitter and everybody could see the YouTube video and then Comics was uh, replying to that and saying so why didn't you tell us directly that it was in like uh, the uh, serial driver because he could see the program content at some point and so he knew exactly that it was in the serial driver. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, so the beginning of these uh, panic dumps are actually just generic information that gives you uh, some, like the timestamp when, when this crash happened, the version and the device model and then you have all the registers and uh, later on in that dump you see uh, some other information like here uh, you can see the exact kernel version string so if someone gives you like a kernel panic dump uh, sometimes it's fake because they want to claim that they have like a bug but here you can see if that doesn't match to the version number above then there's a problem um, you see the version of the, uh, of the boot ROM here and you see important here. You see the slide for the for the kernel address space layout, layout randomization. So the first one is the actual slide value, and the second one is the actual load address of the kernel. So um, then, quite often you see the panicked task information here. So uh, in this case, my my iOS application was called kernel panic. Um, and I started it just like, so it's like a, a, a kernel panic that you can trigger from within, um, um, yeah, you can trigger it from within the sandbox, so it's a very nice bug. Uh, in this case, uh, you see the first one, I didn't uh, X out the ending of that address just because uh, this is like a heap address, so it doesn't give you any information. It's just like the task structure in, in, the, in the kernel heap. Um, yeah, so in this case, you see that in the end, there are some access missing and the reason for that is that sometimes these panic dumps just are cut somewhere in the middle. 
So sometimes, depending on how the crash was, it doesn't even spit out the whole dump, so you are with incomplete information. And sometimes, depending on the bug, um, you don't get here these registers, so they are, they are omitted from some of the panic dumps. So it always depends on the, on the actual panic triggered, what kind of information you get, and uh, this is like the normal one. And sometimes, depending on the bug, you get even more information about the other uh, kernel tasks running at the moment, and this gives you uh, more information about what's happening right now. Anyway, so uh, this was all like, uh, I just remember, see I'm already using too much time for this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So basically it gives you all this information, but there are some problems with this uh, debugging method. First of all, you have no memory content available. Uh, so uh, you cannot see, for example, you see there was an access there, but you don't know why the access was there, and you have no stack dump except for this little backtrace, you have no, uh, no heap and no, uh, no other information. Then you have the other problem on some devices like the iPad mini. Um, depending on the device, uh, there's something broken, so like nearly always when you trigger a kernel panic, the kernel panic dump will just contain the, the name CRC error. Uh, nothing else. And so you don't see what ha what's happening. And sometimes, depending on how hard and where you crash the kernel, it's not even able to, uh, to, to do the, get, uh, the, uh, the panic dumps, so you will get no information. And sometimes, there is like a problem where it crashes so hard that it <coughs> always gives you back the old dump. So you can do a kernel panic, a normal one, uh, you get this, and then from that moment, every time you do a kernel panic, un uh, unless you uh, use a different bug, uh, you always get the old, like two days old, maybe kernel panic dump every time you reboot. It's not giving you the new crash, it's always giving you your old one. Uh, so this makes it very uh, hard for, for working with that. And the other thing is, uh, before iOS 5, or no, before iOS 6, this was one of the main ways people were actually using when they created jailbreaks, because they didn't have other uh, facilities. Uh, since iOS 6, we have all these kernel uh, exploit mitigations, and this makes it a lot harder to just do an exploit with this information. So we need something new. So the new thing, or the, the better thing here, is the KDP, the Kernel Debugger Protocol. And um, yeah, it would be very helpful to have this information. But like I said before, Apple doesn't want you to, to use that. So there's no way to access it directly, for example, from the iOS SDK. Uh, but when you look into, into the actual kernel, you will see that all these strings that you are used to from maybe Ma the Mac OS X kernel, you will see that the KDP is actually in there, and you will see that all the boot arguments that control that, like debug, are also in there. So, um, yeah, so, you, so there is a kernel debugger in there, and actually Apple tells me that they don't want to re uh, remove that exactly for the reason that they sometimes get a factory device and they need to debug it on that device, so they need it on, in that kernel. And um, yeah, so long story short, we need several things to use that. We need uh, a way to connect our device via serial to the Mac. Uh, we have the problem that the GB, GDB does not speak serial UD, uh, KDP, so we need a, a helper application. Uh, normally, we are not able to uh, have these uh, boot arguments, so that we cannot activate that kernel, um, yeah, this kernel uh, uh, debugger. So we either need to be able to give some, uh, have some exploit to be, uh, give it boot arguments, or we need a patched kernel to activate it later on. And um, there's another limitation. So far, no one managed to do this uh, kind of kernel debugging on a device with the lightning connector. Because when you look at the semantics of the actual iPhone 5 or 5S or so, that leaked into the internet, you see that the chip, that serial chip that were used beforehand, it's disappeared from the schematics. So no one knows how this device still speaks serial, but most probably it does somehow. Okay, so in the old way it was very simple. You had this dock connector and uh, there's 30 pins and two of these pins are basically serial. And then you could, uh, could basically buy, uh, create your own uh, cable. You had like a few ingredients in, in total, like, like uh, 30, 35 uh, euro to, to, to build that cable. And uh, well, you can see the slides later. So basically, you attach all this stuff together, and in the end, you have something that looks a lot like this. 
Um, actually, I have, I have something like this in my room, so if you want, I can show you the real thing later. Okay, so and then you can just connect it to your, to your iDevice, and uh, this is the first part. The next thing is you need to uh, download this driver, because otherwise your device cannot speak to the FTDI chip. Um, well, your Mac cannot speak to the FTDI, FTDI chip. And once you install that driver, you can then use it. So now we are back, we have the device, we can connect it and everything. So uh, now we have to basically activate the KDP on the phone. And uh, for the old devices, uh, for iOS 7, unfortunately there's only the iPhone 4 left. Um, but for previously you had like a lot more devices that would work. So for these devices, there's like this boot ROM exploit called Line Rain. And you can use that to directly set the boot arguments uh, with, for example, Red Snow or Open Snow or whatever you you take to boot your, your kernel. And you can just say it, okay, debug equals 0x9, and then you activate uh, the kernel debugger. And here in this table, you can see basically what's happening here. So the first bit tells it that it needs to boot, uh, to help at the boot time. So the moment it starts, it immediately halts. And the other bit is basically uh, enabling uh, debug messages over the C report. And you would basically um, do that on the command line with this comment here. So you call Red Snow, you give it like uh, an IPSW file, you give it the boot arguments, you tell it just boot, and uh, a jailbroken kernel. So far, so good. So then that's what you need to do to, to start the device. And then uh, you would need a GDB. And the normal GDB on, on iOS, uh, no, on, on macOS, didn't have ARM support. But if you downloaded the iOS SDK, until very recently, like iOS 7, there was a GDB binary in the iOS, iOS SDK that gives you ARM support, also gives you KDP support and everything, but only over UDP. But the KDP that we uh, can speak to the device is serial. So that's why we needed always a helper application, and this helper application is called Serial KDP Proxy. This was not originally written for the iPhone, this was actually written by this guy David Elliott, and he used it for real debugging of Mac OS X devices. But for some reason he needed a serial connection, not, a, not an Ethernet connection, so he wrote a little proxy, and that worked perfectly until Mac OS X line, and then a lot of the ports that you will find on GitHub and different places, they stop working. So the, the moment you upgraded to Mac OS X9, your code that worked perfectly before didn't work anymore. And this turned out to be a bug in, to, in that application. So if you want to get the latest or best version of that, just go to my GitHub, which is GitHub slash Stefan Esser. And there you find uh, uh, the one that actually works with the latest iOS versions. So once you have started that, uh, you give it uh, the, um, the actual name of the TTY device, the USB serial one that's registered by the FTDI driver, and then you are all set. Only problem here is that um, the serial connection with the cable is sometimes, depending on how you build the cable, a little unstable, so it could be that you have to restart this program over and over again, because it uses the connection or the communication with the serial port. Actually, I, n I haven't tried Maverick on my device yet, so I don't know if my um, NMI um, flag is uh, that the debugger is entered the moment you trigger an NMI on the device. And back in the days when we tried that on our jailbroken devices, if we triggered the NMI, then um, it would start dumping a panic to the serial and then it would just reboot. And there was no entering the debugger. We never knew why. I only knew from the Apple guys, I knew that this was actually supposed to work because they used it. And they even told me how to use it. But it didn't work for some reason. We never knew why. Later, it suddenly started working with some tricks, which I'll show you now. Uh, it's most probably maybe they changed something in the kernel, or our kernel patches are better since the newer versions. Anyway, now we can basically make use of it. Uh, I'll tell you later how to trigger the NMI. So, okay, if you used the KDP before, you might have seen that it's quite problematic to actually use it because um, 
if you stay inside GDB and you, you look around in the memory uh, while you're connected and you uh, maybe need to go back to another computer, look at something up in either, and you come back, most of the time your device will have rebooted. Or you just try to step through the code and you step once, it's okay, so you step twice, it's okay, and you step the third time and suddenly it reboots the device. Um, so the reason for that was that there is like a watchdog uh, timer in, in, in the back and it realizes when the device is like um, unresponsive for a while then it will just kill uh, the connection, well, will reboot the device basically. And um, especially when we use that NMI feature, every time the watchdog would say there's something strange and it would just reboot immediately. Also, I, I poked a little bit around in, in, in the kernel and realized that um, if you set one of these uh, boot arguments, uh, WDT, which most probably means uh, watchdog timer, you set it to zero, or you use the serial command, which allows you to switch between different serial ports, uh, then uh, it somehow disables the watchdog timer, and from that moment, uh, KDP is a lot more stable and does not always immediately reboot. Uh, Again, uh, KDP still, especially in comparison with, uh, in, in usage with GDB, has a lot of other problems. So sometimes things just don't work, like uh, breakpoints, they only work the first time, the second time they don't work anymore. So, um, but this most probably is one of the reasons uh, GDB is really bad. And if you sniff the actual communication between GDB and KDP, which will I tell you later, is um, you will see that, uh, even simple things like give me 40 bytes, GDB will uh, turn that into 10 packets asking for 4 bytes each. So they will ten, send 10 packets over the serial asking for 4 bytes every time. And other things like that. So GDB and KDP, they are not really like uh, uh, optimized uh, to each other. Okay, so now let's say we now know how we make it more stable. Now I can tell you how this NMI works. So if you set one of these uh, boot arguments, you can uh, use, well, you can take your phone. Well, this is an old one, but it doesn't matter. So, and then you can trigger the NMI, which is a lot like a game console sheet code. So basically you have to press the power button and at the same time the uh, volume down button and for a few seconds. And if you do that for a few seconds, and you're connected over serial, and you have the debug boot argument also, then it will basically um, yeah, start to send over a panic uh, lock to the serial port, which, you will, which we will see in the serial KDP proxy. And when it's finished with that, it waits for the debugger co to connect. So from that moment, you can just connect with GDB and uh, yeah, work with it. So why is that uh, really good? Because previously, there were only one way to enter the debugger, no, two ways to enter the debugger. One way was to basically tell it, I want to break on, on the very first moment it boots. Then you could set some breakpoints and later on come back to GDB. Uh, and aside from that, there was only the other way, you crash the kernel and end up in the debugger. There was no way like, for example, now I want to suspend the kernel. Like, now I did something and I want to see what's happening, so now I want to suspend. There was no way to do that. But with the uh, NMI, you can basically do it any time you want. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is PyKDP. So I already told you that uh, GDB and KDP are not really um, tuned to each other. And uh, sometimes when you use GDB with KDP, it lags really badly. So you, you step once, it's okay. You step twice, it's okay. And then you step again, and it takes like half a minute for this uh, command to execute. Or you just do something, and you next, and then you want to dump the registers, and again it takes like half a minute. So um, this is, mo mo I don't know exactly why it's happening, but it's most probably due to, due to how K uh, GDB is using KDP. Um, and, uh, and other things, if you just want to ask what is at this position in memory and things like that, doing this all with GDB is very painful, especially because uh, the GDB that you have 
is a very old Apple GDB that doesn't have scripting support uh, with Python or so. So you have a very old, very unpowerful GDB that uh, doesn't give you uh, scripting support. And uh, yeah, also, like I said, Apple also removed GDB from iOS 7 SDK. So I started creating PyKDP. And PyKDP is basically uh, a KDP implementation uh, in Python. And it's, at the moment, it only speaks KDP over UDP, so you still need that serial KDP proxy. Maybe in some future version, I will directly let it speak serial, but it's not required at the moment. And this thing here now gives you access to basically, at the moment, only the most important KDP <coughs> features, but in the future to all the KDP features. Um, for example, access to physical memory is already possible which is not that easy or not uh, possible at all with GDB. Um, as, aside from that, yeah, you have all the normal features you can attach and uh, disconnect, you can read or write memory, you can just say, oh, now I set the breakpoints, please continue execution, you can read and write the registers, um, yeah, you can set and so on for the breakpoints. And there's, uh, because it's just pure Python that speaks UDP over the sockets, um, there is no strange C bindings involved, so you don't have like to install a bunch of stuff to get it working. It's just like one uh, Python file that you just include. And I will open source that. Uh, I wanted to do that during the during the conference, but uh, I have to, to to fix some bugs before the release and then do some actual act documentation because otherwise it's not useful. Um, so I will release it most probably early November, like. Maybe if I if I manage to do it, maybe uh, on the first of November, but I'm not sure. Maybe uh, like the weekend afterwards. Okay, so how would you basically use that? Um, using it, it's very simple. For example, this is like an easy hello world type uh, example where you just import the KDP um, module, you uh, create your own uh, object. You connect that object, you, well, you connect that KDP to the actual device. So this would uh, now like wait until there's actually something connected to a serial that waits for the debugger. Um, then you ask in this case for the kernel base, which is one of the uh, variables of that object that are automatically populated. So in the beginning, there's a few packets sent uh, back and forth that uh, do some kind of what, what kind of device am I, am I connected to, what are the features, what is the kernel version, uh, and it also tells you what is the kernel ASLR slide. So these are like things that are auto-populated, and um, here, yeah, you would just uh, calculate the kernel slide and just dump it to the screen so you know where the kernel is, just over this serial. And from here, of course, you can have like uh, more complicated examples like here, uh, I'm just, now that I know where the kernel is, I just read 4096 bytes uh, and then print them out and I see this is basically the, head, the Mach O header of the kernel, so you can basically read everything and, and from there do whatever you want. Or you can write to it and patch uh, information and especially when you connect early on you have no problems with protections, so um, you would be able to write to that because there's no write uh, only yet on, on, on this part of the, of the code. Um, another thing you always want to do is, especially when you debug a, a crash, is you want to be able to dump the registers. This is also very easy. You just use, use the first CPU. Of course, on an old device, there is only one CPU. Uh, you ask it for the thread state, which is uh, at the moment the only thing supported uh, and it will give you back an, an array uh, which contains uh, all these informations here, or all these elements here and uh, for printing out I just changed the last three names to uh, something nicer and then you see this are all the, uh, the actual register values and um, yeah, see, you see I didn't X out something here because that's not a bug, that's basically the initial start state Yeah, in the end, there's a disconnect here. Yeah. yeah, and uh, in, in the actual uh, source distribution that I will then release, there are more examples like how to use breakpoints and everything, uh, but that's not so interesting at the moment. So 
So the next part I want to talk about is extending uh, KDP. The problem here is the, the features that the kernel debugger provides you all are very limited. Um, so if you want more debugging features, you usually have to write them yourself and patch them into the kernel. And uh, back in the days, people like Comex or me, we would do that by patching the system call table um, and add a new system call to the, to the kernel. And then you would boot the modified kernel and use these uh, system calls directly from our apps um, so that we could do uh, kernel debugging stuff like while we are basically exploiting. So I have, for example, kernels that I boot uh, that give me uh, read, write access and allocation access and, and the allocation access directly through an arbitrary system call. And now if I, for example, write an application, I can just use the system call during my exploit and just read and write something, test, for example, I have an assumption like this must be there in memory. I can just check that during my exploit. And later on, when I finalize my exploit, I just like comment all this stuff out, and then uh, everything is fine. Okay, so this ha this has been done a lot of times. Like uh, Comex even released source code for that uh, back in the iOS four days. So I wanted to do something new. So I uh, wanted to uh, because I just uh, invested time to create PyKDP. I wanted to add features to KDP so that I can use them remotely. And I can Python them, I can script the, these features. So in order to do that, you have to look into the actual uh, source code of uh, XNU, which has the full, um, which is basically a Mac OS X kernel, but is also very similar to the iOS kernel. So you see that uh, in the source code, you see that KDP is basically handled by uh, defining requests and responses. And all the requests and responses are going through a dispatch table. And uh, the request handles are very simple. You will see them on the next slide. And um, you can just modify or hook what's, do, what's happening during the uh, one request by just changing these uh, entries in the table. And you might see, unfortunately, I have no label pointer, but you see there are some elements called unknown. So they are only partially used. Then others are just dummy implementations. So they are not, uh, not giving any useful information. So you can just overwrite them especially if you're not GDB and use them, so you know they are dummy anyway. For example, in iOS, the KDP underscore regions is just giving back one region, which is static, which says, I start at zero, and I'm four gigabytes big, and I'm readable, writable, executable, so this is not useful information, so you can just reuse that slot, for example. Uh, other things you could do if you want to reuse something, um, you have their read mem and write mem 64, and breakpoint 64, and so on. And you have the same without the 64. And the only difference here is that um, uh, where they take an address and the parameters, they expect it to be a 64-bit or a 32-bit value. Um, but they still work on the 32-bit processor if you use the 64-bit version. And I'm, if I'm not completely mistaken, GDB also only uses the 64-bit version. So the actual slots for the 32-bit versions are not used at all by anything. So you can rewrite them yourself. Yeah. So um, then the actual packets, uh, like I said, they are sent over UDP, which uh, which is uh, then over sent over serial, um, and uh, the actual packet packets all have a, a little header, which is eight bytes. It contains like the information, uh, what kind of request that is. It has one bit flag that says it's either request or reply. It has a very super secure 8-bit sequence number, but uh, you don't really care because it, it's, a theory, it's all a serial, so you don't care. Uh, you have the length of the entire packet, including the header, and you have a session key. I have no idea what the session key is for because uh, I never needed it for anything, so there's, there's no uh, real need for it. Um, and then each request is defined like this in the source code. You see the read mem request starts with a header, and then it has the address and the number of bytes that you want to read. And what you get in return is the header, an, uh, an error, which is zero if there was no error, and the actual data that is read from the memory. 
And when you look into the implementation of this, uh, this is the readmem function. So all these uh, packet handlers are uh, looking very much the same. They get three input parameters. You have uh, the pointer to the actual packet data. You have an in and out length uh, uh, pointer here. And you have the, the reply port. So this is where, where the answer is supposed to be sent to. And all these handlers basically first do some kind of input validation. So they actually check here that there is enough uh, uh, data sent to basically have the right request. Uh, then they uh, rewrite the packet to, uh, to make it a reply. They fix the size. Uh, then they do some more input validation. Then they do the actual read, which is in the sub-function. Then they adjust the header line against, uh, again because they now read data into the packet. So they, they have to tell, tell it that's uh, containing so much data. And then they uh, fill out the reply port and fill out the actual lens and then it returns. So it's actually a very simple way to do, do that. So what we want to do now is we want to add new functionality. So uh, let's add something new. We add a, a comment here that's just allowing us remotely to allocate memory. It's just an arbitrary ex example. You can do whatever you want there. For example, you could have something that gives you page table access. You could have something that gives you basically read and write access to the actual user space process that is running at the moment because that is something that you cannot do with KDP normally. Uh, yeah, and so in order to do implement our feature, we just need these data structures. So we want to allocate something, so we have to tell it how many bytes. And the return, of course, we want to get the address that was allocated. So that's very simple. Then we can implement that, which will look like here. Uh, you see, we just return this here and everything is fine. Yeah, only one problem here. Um, because we add code to the kernel in an arbitrary position and we have no idea where we are because we don't know yet what code we will override or where we will put ourselves inside the kernel. And because we don't know the KSLR slide, um, all the access to global variables or to functions need to go through pointers in our code. So what I do here is I just define two dummy pointers which I mark with specific values so that I can find them uh, later in the binary. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you would do is you just take this and use your normal C compiler to uh, but tell it to not generate a binary, tell it to generate an assembly file. What will happen is it will spit out ARM assembly like this here, if you do it on with, with a normal Xcode compiler. And you will see it defines a bunch of sections and then the code and here's the data. Problem is, uh, we want to have everything inside, uh, inside uh, some place in the code or in, in, in a specific place in the kernel. So we want to everything to be attached to each other. So nothing should be in the data segment. So the easiest way to, to do that is to just like uh, use a text editor and remove all the section comments and you end up with something like this here. In our case, we only need read access to these pointers, uh, which is fine because um, keep in mind, if we put that somewhere in the text segment, when you, over, when you overwrite something in the text segment, you <coughs> usually have no write access. So uh, if you want to have write access to these variables, um, then you need to do a little more tricks. Then you maybe need to have, uh, a, well, like you need to have the data or references in a different way. Okay, and once you do that, you can just use the uh, AS assembler uh, of the iOS 7 the SDK just uh, uh, tell it to compile it, uh, to, to assemble it. It will give you a mach -O binary. You strip that binary uh, to get rid of anything that's debug information. And then you can convert it into like a, a textual version of that, of these binary things. Then you can write, remove all the headers and the footers. And what you end up with is like binary code in Python that uh, contains the actual uh, code that you, the handler that you just created or you can use it any other way you want. The only problem here is on Linux or so, you would use the object dump, uh, no object copy for, uh, binary for that, but on, on Mac OS there is, uh, as far as I know, there is nothing uh, really good to simulate the same thing. So most of the time you have to do it manually or write your own code. So, and then you can put all that into a PyKDP script. Um, see here we have the code, 
Then we do our connection. We calculate some, some values. In this case, they are hard-coded. But because you have read and write access, you can basically find them in the kernel yourself. But here, they are hard-coded. Um, you attach the two, uh, the, two the, KLOC, the real KLOC address and the real KDP address to the end of the code, because that's where they were. And uh, then you write the code into a specific uh, target address. That's, in this case, I just overwrite an unused function in the kernel. And um, then you write the actual, into the actual dispatch table. Uh, we overwrite the readmem uh, comment because readmem is never used because we always use the 64-bit version. Uh, we write it there and then we call that readmem function 50 times. And the result of this is this here. So you see you get a lot of allocations and all these are uh, kernel heap pointers and like all um, uh, 1,536, which is exactly uh, the amount um, we allocated here. And uh, this is exactly the size of one of the k-alloc zones, so that's why all of them are uh, next to each other. Or well, there might be some, uh, some in between that are not next to each other, but in general they should be next to each other. Okay, so before I, I run out of time, uh, let's come to the last and maybe most powerful thing for kernel uh, exploit developers. It's kernel heap recording and visualization. macOS and iOS both give you the opportunity to use uh, debug boot arguments that are already existing in the kernel. Um, they are, in this case, well, they are they're actually more, but these are the ones we, knew, we use. We have the ZC, which activates zone logging in corruption mode. There's another mode for, for detecting leakage, but for our case, for export development, we are interested in corruption mode. Um, we have uh, a comment called setlog, which allows us to specify one of the zone names. If you don't know what a zone is, uh, just uh, look up my, my slides from last year where I explained all the heap allocators, or the most important ones. So basically, let's say we have a zone that's called like this, so we can, from the, from the debug boot arguments, we can tell it setlog equals this name here, and then we tell the kernel to lock access to that zone. And uh, we can tell it to use 8,000 records, which is the, I think, hard-coded maximum in the kernel. So if you boot your device now with these arguments, so what does it actually do? Uh, it will lock all the allocations that happen and all the deallocations in that one zone and lock them to a ring buffer that is uh, 8,000 elements long. So if you have more than 8,000 allocations or deallocations, we're like, oh, well, you know, it's a ring buffer. So, um, and for every allocation, you get basically a, a, something like a timestamp, which doesn't really, it's not really a timestamp, it's like more a counter. Um, you get the address that was either allocated or the one that was attempted to deallocate. And you get the last 50 elements of the backtrace. Okay. So how do you boot your device? Of course, you do it the same way as we did it before. Uh, just uh, instead of debug, we now activate the, uh, the actual uh, uh, zone logging. Or we could do both at the same time. So we have the kernel debugger and the logging at the same time. OK, you boot your device. What now? Actually, under normal circumstances, you shouldn't see any difference except maybe that your device is slower because no more kernel memory was used, so your device has less memory and so maybe, maybe something is slower. Um, the interesting thing here is that Apple uh, never thought about like implementing any feature to read that information that is now recorded into the, into the kernel heap or data. Uh, yes, if some of this is data and some, uh, kernel data and some of it's kernel heap. So all this recorded information is basically just there in, in, in the kernel and there's some pointers pointing to it. But there's no feature actually to read it back. So you cannot access it from user space. So the only way to get to it is uh, by, for example, patching in own, own features into the kernel or, for example, using PyKDP and reading it from the kernel. Yeah. 
So depending on your on your actual current system, you either uh, well your your current uh, let's say requirement, you can either do it really with via PyKDP or through the well you first have to do the NMI one and then you can use PyKDP or you have your own system call and then you do it from within your exploit and check it. That's what my my preferred wor version of it. Okay, so. When you do that, uh, you might have looked at the source code of XNU and you will realize the iOS kernel, the binary, looks there like completely 100% different from what's in the source. And that's actually true. Uh, for some reason, the actual mountain lion uh, heap logging and the iOS 6 heap logging are completely different. So in mountain line you have like just some simple pointers and simple uh, simple allocations uh, buffers, uh, but on on iOS you have like elements like this. Uh, actually, they are very similar to those defined in the XNU source code, but they are like uh, switch around the, uh, the the position of some of the elements. But this one here actually doesn't exist in uh, in, uh, in the XNU source code, so this is all reversed. Uh, and what the interesting thing here is they, are, they have like a pre-logging hook and a post-logging hook and they allow the, you to add extra hook data but again this is just like lying around in the kernel there's no code making use of that so there's not even like any driver or so making use of it so you can just see that there's like this code there and it's using it like this but they're all they null pointers, they're not used Okay, and the rest of it is like a lot of it is like uh, like just informational character, like how many elements there are, how long the maximum back backtrace is, which you also cannot inference because it's hard coded to fifteen, and like the, the the size of one of these elements and so on. So what you need to do now is you you do whatever you want inside the kernel, and you need to gather the data. <coughs> Again, you can do that on the device with like an uh, an patched uh, system call into the kernel. Or you can do it via KDP remotely with PyKDP, for example, or with UGDB or whatever. And then you would dump it into a, into a binary file. And in my case, I then convert the binary file to a JSON. Um, actually, I'm using a dirty PHP script for that. And it's not even Python. Maybe in the final version, I uh, make it Python script. And then you feed it to the visualization tool. The visualization tool is... Uh, an attempt of mine to uh, to program something in JavaScript, which uh, I would call desperately failed. Mm -hmm. well, it, well, it works, but it's the worst code I have ever written. And before I will open source that, I have to completely clean that. Um, and the nice thing here is it gives you an insight into a visual insight into the heap status in different uh, moments in the timeline. I will show it you uh, like uh, well, basically half life. Um, yeah, it's, it's really awesome do, during creating a kernel exploit uh, because suddenly, for example, you, you don't understand why your exploit is not working and you feed it to the heap uh, visualization tool and then you see, wait a second, why is there this block allocated that's not supposed to be there? And then you, what well, you see later, you can basically see who allocated it and then you can um, yeah, change your uh, kernel exploit. So basically, what I will show it to you uh, 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 like live in, 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 in um, uh, well, in the browser. So um, it will look like this here. And uh, before I explain it, I will just show it to you. So this is like one of the possible test runs. Um, actually, the colors at the moment are uh, given to the site uh, every time you refresh the site by random, except the, the blue ones. Uh, they are fixed because the blue ones are the, the free list, the current heap free list. Uh, and the more uh, light the blue is, the more it's in the front. So you also see the number uh, down here is a zero. So this is uh, the next element in the free list. And the more darker the blue gets, uh, uh, the more it's behind in the free list. Uh, aside from that, all the colors are assigned by random. And the only thing is, uh, if it's the same color, that means the same code pass inside the kernel allocated this. And then um, you can just hover over some of these and you see uh, the backtrace 
And uh, I, I even used a script from, from, from IDA to just export all the names to a JSON file. So this website takes this JSON file, so it has, has the symbols that you have. And then you can see exactly who allocated that block. In a different position, it will be something different. Um, yeah, here for example, you see there's a driver open with service open extended and so on. And uh, yeah, in other cases, you will find different stuff like here, for example, this is the pipe system call and, uh, and things like that. So, you know, but this is not the only thing you can do. One thing that's currently broken is uh, you can enter a regular expression up here and then it will search from, well, before I explain you that, I should tell you, show you the timeline. So you basically have a timeline here, you have a slider. You, so you can go back in time and see at one, what happened in the, in the actual heap and you see uh, at what moment in time what was allocated. Yeah. So on. Oh, one thing I didn't tell you is um, these blocks here that are like grayed out, <coughs> those blocks are, because we only have like a room of 8,000 elements, um, we, we know that these blocks are actually used because we know that this page is used because we see other blocks in here. But during our 8,000 8, backlog, there's no action on these blocks. We only know that they must be allocated, but they are not touched in that time. So this is just dead. Yeah, so okay. So the, the idea of the regular expression that's not working at the moment correctly is uh, you enter something and it will scan through all the backtraces and will, it put you, uh, will, will send you to the next moment in time this uh, string shows up in one of the uh, backtraces. For example, you want to exploit POSIX spawn, so you would enter POSIX spawn up there, and then it will put you, uh, bring you to the moment in the timeline POSIX spawn is actually used. This sometimes works, sometimes not. Uh, because there's, there's some strange bug. Like I said, this code is like really bad. Okay, so um, I have another example. Actually, because uh, I, I, do not know, I don't know how much time I have left, because uh, my clock is gone. Okay, so this is another example. Uh, so for example, here you can see, well, actually you cannot because it's uh, Here you can see that it was a, a, a Mach message that used the open extended to open a driver. And this open driver uh, passes the properties that you give it with OS unserialized XML, which is a function I discussed last year in, uh, in Black Hat for heap uh, feng shui. And then you can see that it uses the uh, creates object like OS data, and OS data then uses k-alloc, and k-alloc uses set alloc, and then it allocates the memory. And then you can see that this was, these, were, these here were allocable I use uh, in my, my OS trainings to explain how you can still use OS unserialized XML. But I'm not showing it to you right now. I'm just showing you the last example, which was a, a, a hands-on test in my <laughs> iOS security class. Um, so this is like a, a, a logging in this case. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, um, you always see the block size up there, so it's uh, auto-guessing what the current block size is. In this case, it's a 32 bytes zone. So you see there's a lot of allocations here. And the task was draw pictures with heap feng shui. <laughs> and uh, so here you can see the pictures. <laughs> one, time, uh, one time it's basically uh, allocated and we used a free list to, do, to draw uh, um, a smiley and one time we used a, a different allocation to, uh, to fill this thing here. Yeah, and like I said, this tool and the other thing with, with some basic data documentation will be uh, released early November for everyone to use it. And the last thing I want to say is that um, I'm working on an improvement because as it is right now, it has a bunch of limitations. Right now it can only lock one kernel zone at a time, but during heap exploitation you often require to control several zones at the same time. So uh, what I'm working on is uh, like a kernel patch very similar to the, to the stuff I, I, I used um, uh, like for to patch new features in the KDP, 
So I, I patch a new system call in there that allows me to activate and deactivate my own kernel logging. And there are a few limitations I want to lift. For example, at the moment you have a backtrace of 15, <coughs> which is most of the cases okay, but sometimes it's not good. And also there are some problems. The current logging sometimes re re returns dirty, uh, dirty addresses. So there are some fields that are giving back completely strange pointers because they are leftovers from the last run. So I don't like that. So I will, I will fix that for, for my own code. Um, the limitation of 800 allocation, uh, 8,000 allocation deallocations, normally in most of the cases is not a problem because you, uh, when you try something, you are basically trying it right now and then you dump. So uh, it should be in the last 8,000. Uh, but I will lift that uh, too by having like a user space daemon just pull that pulls all the, uh, the information into user space all the time so we are not wasting kernel memory. Um, there are some zones that uh, grow uh, every time they run out of space. They grow uh, not by one page at a time but by multiple pages at a time. Uh, these are not the problem for the logging but these pages uh, these, uh, those are a problem for the visualization tool as it is right now because as you can see here this visualization tool actually uh, needs to know that this is all belonging to the same uh, page or so and if you have like uh, a block that is bigger than a page then it gets harder because from an address you cannot immediately see where a block is inside a page so as long as you're inside a page basically the address of the uh, the, the lower 12 bits basically tell you where exactly it is or, or yeah but if you have like bigger than one page that it doesn't help you anymore um, yeah and there's other stuff like uh, right now my JavaScript needs to emulate the free list uh, the new tool will basically uh, dump the free list so that you know the real free list um, yeah there's something missing like if you have a, a, an exploit on a new device you also want to know what CPU thread and maybe other information like what kernel, you know, what, what, what process allocated that memory and this is all missing so uh, all this will be in, in the final version and yeah I will also release that but it's most probably not being released anywhere before December or so. Oh yeah, and that's over the questions. Um, yeah, any questions? <coughs> so just, just to clarify Stephen, to get this Get this working. You've got to use the LimeRain exploit to restore the old, older device. Well, you can use LimeRain for the older device, or um, I'm not I'm not perfectly sure if they released it at the moment. But some guys wrote um, a tool that would, uh, well, if you have like an actual jailbreak on iOS 6 with Evasion, uh, that tool would. Um, yeah, use the evasion uh, security features uh, that they that they basically give you. Uh, they will use this stuff to patch the kernel on the fly and activate um, uh, the kernel debugger at runtime, which is a lot like what I presented last year at at Kensec. So I discussed it in Kensec how you would what you what you need to do at runtime. So I'm not so sure if they actually released it yet. Um, but still, even then, it would only work on, on devices that are already jailbroken. So it's like a chicken egg problem. You need like a, a vulnerability already working to activate the debugger. So with, with the, the older devices in the line range, you can use the more recent iOS versions? Well, it works, it works perfectly on, on 6.1 or something. Uh, for iOS 7, it, uh, you might need uh, a different, um, yeah, you might need a different tool like open snow or so. And even then you might pet, need to patch it your own because uh, the kernel patches uh, open snow applies are not that great. So I, I have my own patcher for that and then, yeah. was like how you would debug vulnerabilities uh, to be able to write your own exploits. Uh, there's a lot of, of uh, possible good uses for exploits on iDevices uh, because imagine someone owns your, your iPhone, there's no way for you to find it out except you uh, jailbreak it yourself. 
there's no way if there's some someone uh, smuggling code into your i device with like a, a like a private jailbreak there's no way for you to detect it there's absolutely no chance of you ever detecting that so the only the only chance to do that is basically by having your own exports and and then there are like, there are other users like I, I know of a company in, in china who basically creates hardware add-ons for iPhones, but these hardware add-ons only work with jailbroken devices, so that's why you also need to jailbreak. Yeah, there are actually companies that build a, a business on jailbroken devices. I don't know how, how, how intelligent that is, but uh, yeah, they, uh, they do that, and um, they obviously make money with it. And some of them do actually large donations back to the, to the jailbreak community, to the actual jailbreak developers. Yeah, more questions. Then I'm. Is Apple winning this? What? Is Apple winning this? Apple winning? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think the, the problem right now is that um, the, the pool of people that will do all this for free is. Uh, is uh, uh, getting smaller with every new uh, iOS version um, and the skill set inside that small pool is rather like fixed to some few heads so maybe there are right now like two guys that are actually doing stuff and at some point they most probably get an offer by some other company and then they're going to um, and so far everybody who wanted to get into that Maybe they succeeded, but they never made anything public. So the, those guys that actually do public stuff, they are getting smaller and smaller. They don't want to, to, to see the fact, but it's actually happening. You can see that. Every time they release a jailbreak, they create a new team, and every time the team gets smaller. And um, yeah, so uh, is Apple willing? I don't know if they're actually winning, because there are like a lot of people doing that uh, privately selling to governments. and. Like for example, when I killed that one POSIX spawn uh, bug that turned out to be more than like an info leak, uh, I, I heard that there were like four or five guys who were really pissed at me because they had this bug and most probably sold it to a government. So yeah, so you can see there there is a lot of talent and Apple is not winning. Apple, uh, when you when you look at at how they patch some stuff, it's like unbelievable. They patch only one code path to the same bug or or they. Or they don't see the bug that is right next to the other bug, and they only fix one of them. Or maybe they see it, but they don't uh, don't close it. It's also the Apple winning that maybe the open jailbreakers are losing. Yeah, I I, I would say Apple Apple is not really winning. They 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 just, they just created like uh, some mitigations now, which makes it a lot harder, and which even made the pool of people doing it publicly smaller. Because those that have the skills usually work in the in the industry and. They don't have time to give uh, away hundreds of thousands of work uh, hours or so for free. The other thing with the uh, the niche, what with the you know, said before about the iPad mini, um, getting stupid, uh, useless uh, kernel panic. Uh, oh yeah. The, the, what, the, what's your theory on that? Why why is the niche different from the rest of the other devices? I have no idea. No one has has an idea. <laughs> uh, it's just like uh, the strange thing is, I have personally seen kernel panics on my iPad mini. But at some point in time, it just stopped working. So maybe there's a bug in the hardware so that if you once trigger a certain condition, something breaks and then there's uh, Because CRC error sounds like something is broken or so. So maybe there's some hardware element that's all broken in all the iPad minis. We will maybe see if there's like the new iPad minis when they come out, if they have the same problem or if the problem is gone. Because so far, um, Oh, actually it's not true. If you search for the string CRC error in the internet, you will find at least one posting in some Apple forum where someone was using an iPhone 4S, I believe, had the same problem. So maybe there's really a hardware uh, element that's maybe more vulnerable in the iPad mini uh, than in other devices. But no one knows. And are you going to keep that doing it? What? Are you going to keep that doing it? Well, Maybe for at least the next half a year or so, uh, at, at some point I'm getting bored of this. And uh, 
when you when you look at what Apple did, uh, they did like a huge jump uh, between iOS 5 and iOS 6. <coughs> but when you now look at iOS 7, uh, the jump is not that high anymore. They, they did something which will really uh, <coughs> make uh, a lot of people angry because they made the whole persistence game a lot harder now. Um, and this is what all the guys them adding too many new mitigations in the future. And at some point, it's just like breaking the same over and over again, and then it gets boring, and then I leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, more questions or otherwise I believe there's a tea break that we are always